This morning's scripture reading comes to us from the book of Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to all the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this place and for this time that you have prepared for us. We thank you that you are here in our midst that you have promised to never leave us or forsake us. Lord, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear from you, for we are here to worship you and you alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in the third week of Easter, so happy Easter, friends. We like to think of Easter as one Sunday when we worship the risen Christ, But I'm reminded of a song I sang as a youth that says, every morning is Easter morning from now on. Every day's a resurrection day. The past is over and gone. You see, the risen Christ is risen from that first Easter morning on. We today don't live a day when we don't know the power and truth of the resurrection. And this morning's passage is a message to those first witnessing the resurrection and its power, and it's a message for us today as well. This morning's passage takes us directly to the end of Peter's sermon in Acts 2. Sorry, you have to start at the beginning of my sermon. Peter is talking to this group of Jewish people who just 50 days before could have been a part of the crowds yelling, crucify him. Yet here they are today, because something in them realized that the truth and power, what was happening behind the resurrection, something happened in the disciples' lives as well. For they all fled on the night of the crucifixion, and yet here they are, gathered together, sharing about the resurrection to those who would have been a part of Jesus' crucifixion. Thomas Oden, in his book, Classic Christianity, says that the disciples' reaction to the resurrection is a huge reason people believe it to be true today. The disciples' belief and then their action is incredible evidence of something that had to be true. When you believe passionately about something, you want to share it. You buy the t-shirt, you post it on social media, you share it with your friends and family. For the disciples, the change in their demeanor and actions was a witness then, and it's a witness today. Odin says, their lives were completely reversed by the resurrection. They were changed persons. This is evident in their actions. They had left the burial scene with a deep sense of loss, facing the collapse of what they had hoped would be be a decisive event in Israel's history. Suddenly, these same persons who we see portrayed in Acts are willing to risk their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their behavioral change was instantaneous, radical, and enduring. It's time to buy the t-shirt, friends. The resurrection is a true event in our history, and it's one for those who yelled crucify him on the night of his crucifixion. It's one for those of the disciples who fled and ran away. It's 
one for us who have at times turned away. Peter makes the claim that the Lord, uh, Jesus is Lord and Messiah. Other translations say Lord and Christ or Lord and Savior. There is something powerful about the and here. What does it mean to say that Jesus is both Lord and Savior? This is a question any person going up for ordination in the United Methodist Church must answer. To claim that someone is Lord means we honor them as someone who has authority, power, and influence in our lives. When we claim Jesus as Lord, we are claiming that following Jesus is something we will do as he is a leader, a teacher, a healer. We recognize Jesus' influence in our lives, and we obey what he says to do. This is often difficult for us to grasp today. We live in a world where leaders have failed us, failed those on the margins, have chosen their own way over what is best for the good of people. And if we're honest, we often buy into the mantra that says, I get to choose my own way because it is my right. And you're right. You do get to choose and think for yourself. We like to think we do it all on our own, but that's not the case. Psychology Today says that there are four outside factors that influence most people in their decision-making today. They say we like to believe that we think alone, but it, when it comes to life-changing choices, we typically don't. Family history, memories, group trust, and cultural expectations tend to heavily weigh in and influence the decisions we make. We make choices on what has worked for us in the past or what hasn't worked, on what our family valued or didn't value, based on what our family, friends, work say to us. We make decisions based on what is happening in our culture around us. All of these influences can end up having a power they should not if we turn to them alone, if we end up calling them Lord and not Jesus Lord. These influences may be good and healthy in our lives, but no matter how much we think we can do it on our own, there are influences that go into anything and everything we do. As Christians, as people who call Jesus Lord, his influence needs to be first. And that's why the second part of Jesus' title is so important. Jesus is not just Lord in our life, but Savior as well. Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed, is the one who lived, died, and rose again so that we might be saved. These are non-negotiables in the Christian faith. We say it every week, whether through the Apostles' Creed or through the Nicene Creed as we did today. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human for our sake. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. If we're honest with ourselves, Jesus must be both Lord and Savior, or he can be neither in our lives. We don't get to pick Jesus as Savior and not follow him as Lord. We don't get to decide which things we like about what he said and which things we'll choose to disregard. The benefit, though, is that he will be both Lord and Savior, and we're not left to navigate this world alone. We're promised he will walk with us and that we will be with him forever. This message that Peter was preaching to this crowd is preached to us as well. 
And as we have said several times over the past month, month, if you think there is something you have done that could keep you out of God's grace, look at who's preaching this sermon, the denier. Look at who he was preaching to, those who yelled, crucify him. Jesus wanted to be Lord and Savior for them, and he wants to be Lord and Savior for us. The next line in the passage, after Peter has called them out for being a part of that crowd, may be one of my favorite lines in scripture. So now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? They were so eager to know the risen Christ, to know this person Peter was preaching about, that they were instantly cut to the heart. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been sitting in a worship service here and in many other places, listening to a sermon and feeling as if the preacher was preaching directly to me. It's as if I'm the only one sitting there and the preacher knows everything about me. Maybe that's happened to you before too. I get the feeling that with this crowd, when they heard pre pre Peter preaching, they felt this. They ha may have worried that Peter was calling them out to condemn them, or maybe they had an aha moment and had been sitting on the edge of their seats waiting to hear more, probably a mixture of both. I think they knew in their hearts that they wanted something different and Peter was able to tell them about it and lead them to Christ. And that's what he did. He told them to repent, to be baptized and to receive the Holy Spirit. This message sounds familiar. John the Baptist and Jesus preached repentance. They modeled baptism and Jesus promised that when he ascended, he would send the Holy Spirit. We're first called to repent. Repent in this verse is translated from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Often we talk about repentance from the Hebrew word shuv, which means to turn around, to stop going in one direction, i.e. the direction of sin, and to turn towards grace and forgiveness and right living. You can almost hear your GPS saying recalculating as you change directions. In this verse, though, repentance means to change your mind. Peter isn't saying they immediately change their behavior. He is first inviting them to change their mind about who they thought Jesus was. They had thought of Jesus as a fraud, as a criminal. When they repent and change their mind, they now can see him as Lord and Savior. They have a better understanding of who he is, and they long to live under his influence and authority. The powerful thing about repentance is that as they change their minds, their behavior changed as well. That's the incredible thing about repentance in all of our lives. It's a beautiful work of grace. What habits need to change? What attitudes need to change? What relationships need forgiveness? I remember needing to repent of an attitude of apathy several years ago. Every time someone would ask me how I was doing, I'd say, eh, okay, hanging in there. It became such a habit that I wondered if I was really okay or if I was doing well. There was a man in our church in Oklahoma that every time someone asked him how he was, he would respond with, this could be the best day of my life. One Sunday as I was greeting people and they were greeting me and I was answering with my, eh, I'm okay. I heard him down the hall respond to somebody with, this could be the best day of my life. And it struck me how I wanted that. It struck me more how I had that, but wasn't acknowledging the grace that God was giving me every day in my life. My mind had to change. I had to repent. Are there days when I'm just hanging in there? Absolutely there are. But it's not an everyday occurrence. 
There's plenty of days that are absolutely wonderful as well. Oftentimes, when repentance is taught or preached, you hear repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is literally good news. And when we repent and receive that good news, we receive it in abundance. Yep, this could be the best day of my life. After repenting, Peter tells them to be baptized. For those gathered there listening to Peter, baptism would have been needed. Baptism was an invitation to have their sins forgiven, the waters of baptism to wash over and cleanse. If you've been baptized, every time you repent and grow in grace that God has given us, we remember how the waters of baptism have cleansed us and been a grace in our lives. In baptism, Will Willimon says, the recipient of baptism is just that, a recipient. You cannot very well do your own baptism. It's done for you, to you. As United Methodists, we believe in one baptism because it's not our work, it's God's work. Whether you were baptized as an infant, youth, or child, or an adult, whether you were baptized by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, it's the work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being poured out through grace and water. Our baptism was and is a sacred moment in our lives, and every day we're invited to remember it. If you were baptized as an infant or child and don't have a full memory of it, give thanks to your parents, grandparents, church family who stood and said they would nurture you in the faith. If you were baptized as a youth or adult, give thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit leading you into this decision. If you've yet to be baptized, we would love an opportunity to talk with you about this incredible moment and sacrament in our faith. As United Methodists, we celebrate two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. We believe these are sacraments because Jesus participated in them, and our connection to Jesus is what we call the holy mystery in these moments, for he is very present in them. A book that has meant a lot to me is called Searching for Sunday by Rachel Held Evans. She breaks the chapters down into sacred moments, some we would consider sacraments and others high holy moments in our lives. In her chapter on baptism, she recalls how Martin Luther often slipped into dark places. My guess is each and every one of us have had moments like that. When Luther was in a dark place, though, it was said he would say, Martin, be calm. You are baptized. Martin, remember your baptism. Evans says, I suspect his comfort came not from recalling the moment of baptism itself or in relying on baptism as a sort of magic charm, but in remembering what his baptism signified, his identity as a beloved child of God. Because ultimately, baptism is naming. When Jesus emerged from the waters of baptism in the Jordan, a voice from heaven declared, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus did not begin to be loved at the moment of baptism, nor did he cease to be loved when his baptism was just a memory. Baptism simply named the reality of his existing and unending belovedness. So too it is with us. In baptism, we are identified as beloved children of God. Finally, Peter tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. Just before this, as the disciples and many others gathered, the Holy Spirit had descended upon them. This helper whom Jesus had promised is given to his followers. And the passage tells us, the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. The promise of the Holy Spirit is not just for a select few, but is expansive 
and beautiful. The same Holy Spirit that descended on those gathered there is offered to us as well. The Holy Spirit works in us through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit guides, comforts, convicts, advocates, and leads us, just as the Holy Spirit did in those days. Our passage ends that, those, that so those who welcomed this message were baptized, and about 3,000 persons were added. Friends, this is what we are to do as well. Repent, be baptized, or remember your baptism, and receive the Holy Spirit. With the changing of our minds comes the changing of our lives. Let us devote ourselves to this practice, to this understanding that God is very present in these moments and ready to meet with us. For you see, every morning is Easter morning from now on. And we put our hope and trust in the one we call not just Lord, but Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, thank you for meeting us right where we are. Help us to follow you in all ways, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. That your influence and authority would be in our lives. That we would seek you in all things. We love you and we praise you. Amen.